the world's viewpoint of the apocalypse being the end of the world, that the book of Revelation is to show us the beast. Triple six. Scary horsemen. The beast, his mark, the fear, the zombies. But this isn't the full story. The full story is this. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the victorious one. The one who was crucified, but rules and reigns forever. The one who is coming to fetch us. The apocalypse is the revelation of Christ, the lamb that was slain, but who is now and forevermore will be the roaring lion of Judah. This is the revelation. Hey, good morning. I, uh, I'm trusting that uh, as we're working through the book of Revelation, as, we, as we're working through, that you're starting to see something of a shift in your lives where there's something of you being blessed more and more and more. Not about less chaos. That's not going to happen. But something, because let me read this to you. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it. Take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. I'm in it to win it. I'm, I'm in this life. I'm not, I'm not here so that I can place lost. I'm not here that I can fail. I'm not here. I know he that is first will be last. I know the theology. But I'm saying I'm a born again son of God, spirit filled, child of God. I'm not in it to lose. I'm not in it to come last. I'm in it to win it. Okay, those who said amen, you can join me. The rest of you, we'll let you know how it goes. We need to shift from this mentality of, I'll just slog along and be a Christian. You're not going to make it out alive. Out of this world, you're not making it out alive. Make it count. Make it mean something that when you pass on, that your kids will go, I saw God through what dad did. I saw heaven through the through, through mom, the way she behaved. I, I saw reality of a, a, a greater existence than what I see in the natural. I'm going to pray, then we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll minister to us this morning, through me this morning, for the glory of your kingdom, for the sake of your bride, for the growth of the army, and for the strength of your body. Lord, I pray that what you have allowed me to prepare will be delivered according to your standards and not mine. May this speak into the depths of our hearts. May it bring change eternal. Our hearts are open. Our minds are open to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. We pray this in Jesus' name, like I said. Amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, Angel of the church in Philadelphia, to the leader, the senior pastor of Philadelphia, write this. This is what I'm going to be saying to you. So, Philadelphia means brotherly love. Uh, it, 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 Greek origins, the, 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 this, this philos, this brotherly love that these two brothers had for each other. That's how the city was formed. And it, it, it was probably the, the youngest city out of the seven that Jesus is addressing in the book of Revelation. For those of you who haven't been following, Jesus, through this incredible revelation, the apocalypse, this unveiling that he's given John, who's stuck on the Isle of Patmos, on the island of Patmos, he's stuck there. Jesus has this incredible vision that he gives him as he makes known what is to come as he sets up what is going to be taking place. And he, he, he addresses seven churches. This being the sixth one in the installment, he's addressing them. And every church he addresses, almost every, he goes to the angel of that church, he then, which is the leader, the messenger. He then says, this you have done well. So he's got this commendation going, well done, you, you're doing that well. And then he says, however, I have this against you. And then he says, but this is the remedy. Except to the church in Sardis, there's no well done. It's, guys, you're messing up. Stop. Else I'm going to blot you out of existence. So there's no commendation. There's a straightforward rebuke. The church in Philadelphia is the only one where there's no rebuke. It's the only one that they don't get moaned at for something. 
do you think it was a perfect church? No. Because there were people in it. And we know from working with people that it can be a challenge. I'm not saying that. I've heard so. It's impossible that this church is perfect. But Jesus is not going to address every small little pernickety thing because he's not human that moans about everything. His standards are higher than ours, but his grace is greater than ours. And he goes straight into just commending them. And stuff happened in this church. There was, in the whole region, so let me give you a bit of background. In this region, there was this ridiculous earthquake, 17 AD. But it, it shook the foundations of Sardis, um, from Smyrna, Sardis. Uh, even Ephesus felt it. Philadelphia felt it really badly as well. In Philadelphia, what had happened, it shook the place so badly that everything collapsed. It was so severe that even the, the emperor had declared that for two years, they wouldn't have to pay tax. So you know what kind of calamity that had taken place there, that your leader says, I'm not going to tax you for two years. Imagine if the government did that for us. No tax. No VAT. Your salary is your salary. Petrol will cost three rand eighty. Sorry, I hate bringing negative stuff into the sermon because I never have to, I don't never want a negative connotation, so I'll try not to speak about the price of fuel. He says no tax for two years. But what had happened, what was really felt in this church in Philadelphia, that is up to two decades after this earthquake, they were feeling aftershocks. It ran that deep in Philadelphia. The other guys had rebuilt. It, it, it's so interesting that after this earthquake, within the main temple, within the main structure of this, the city, only the pillars remained. I've got a picture of the pillars that actually stayed behind. That's what's kind of left. And then you've got the rocket church, the, well, the rocket mosque in the back there that they built. Because the whole of Turkey, where all these churches are located, it is the most Islamic country in the world. It's every, the most Islamic country that hasn't banned Christianity completely. You're allowed to be a Christian, but just don't, don't act like one. It's the only thing that remained there are the pillars. And I think there's a lesson to be learned. The, the earthquake hit them and devastated them. The aftershock never caused any damage. I'd like to encourage you, if you've gone through chaos in your life and you've rebuilt something of that, it could be a dreadful divorce. It can be a, a, a financial meltdown. If you've gone through chaos, what sometimes happens, it's like with this earthquake that took place in Philadelphia. For years afterwards, whenever there'd be a tremor, people would start panicking, going, is it all going to fall down again? Are we going to have to rebuild again? Is everything going to collapse again? And this is not in Scripture. This is a bit of a history lesson. But what happens in our lives sometimes is when we've gone through chaos, when we've gone through trauma, whether it's health. You know, so you, you, you had a lump in your neck before. It was removed by surgery or God healed you, whatever was necessary to have the healing. And then you feel a little bump there. What happens? You panic and you think what happened before, that's coming again. We've got to start understanding that we can have chaos happen in our lives and the tremors must not create fear in our lives. Don't have the, so you, you've gone through financial chaos and you've recovered and all of a sudden you're having a bad month or you've gotten yourself into, do not have what you're going through constantly remind you of what you've been through unless it's giving glory to Jesus and thanking him for what he's taken you through. Never let the tremors direct your path because this is what happened. They never rebuilt properly. When you have tremors in your life of potential chaos, if you have tremors in your life, perhaps I'm going to get sick again. Perhaps I'm going to go through financial ruin again. Perhaps this is going to happen again. We tend not to build strong. I'm telling you, risk it all. Build, love passionately, give your all. Give your all to Jesus. When it comes to being a Christian, what Rex shared, what Martin has shared, it's go in all out regardless of the gifting you've been given. This church, uh, in all these churches, there was a denominational element. Not a normal denomination, but there was a weird denomination that Jesus addressed. He called them the synagogue of Satan. So it wasn't a real church, but it was a group of people that would cause havoc. And too often, there's always something wanting to destroy a church. There's always, if the church is 
celebrating Jesus, pursuing what the Father has set out for them. If, if the church is spirit-filled, we're desperate to see the sick healed, marriages restored, life being given, operating in exceptional grace where we go, come as you are, operating exceptional power where we're trusting that God is going to change you into who he needs you to be. You've put a target on your back, the enemy's going to attack that church. That's what happens. And that's you being part of the church, you're going to have a target on your back. But we never, ever, ever partner with the synagogue of Satan with criticizing, rebuking, even bad churches. This is what happens, friends. So you go and you complain about another church. I'm not talking about secunda churches. I'm talking about you complain about a church overseas, one that you've never been to, you've never met the pastor, you've never, ever, nothing. It, it's, you've never even gone to that country and it's a problem for you. That church is a problem for you. You criticize, you comment. All that you're doing is you're allowing all your friends that don't like church to gather more ammo to complain about church. We don't need to attack churches. That's the devil's job. That's the synagogue of Satan's job. And I don't want you to go, I know people that are like that. No, no. We must check ourselves. There is no perfect church. There are churches that are messing up monumentally. And if God has given you grace to go and lead a church, go and do that. And then we'll have a different discussion of how difficult ministry can be. I have a, I have a pastor's kid sitting here. Um, he's leading the meeting this morning, and he's a fantastic PK. And he'll tell you, and I'm sure, who else, who else's parents, besides my kids, keep your hands down, who, who else's parents lead a church? You, know, that, it's, you, you put your hand up and you're like, no. We're not called to criticize churches. We're called to speak life over situations. We're called to love passionately. Now, what had happened for in this church 16 months ago, roughly, we went through a whole shaking and a whole lot of chaos. It was, it was mayhem. We had, we had just come out of lockdown. We couldn't meet. There was issues on eldership. There was chaos that took place. And then the Lord told me in all that chaos, you keep quiet. You sit on your hands, which, for me, which means you say nothing, you do nothing. Because sometimes we want to be the Holy Spirit Junior. We want, Lord, I've got this. I'll do it. You back me up. And what I've loved is when people say to me, you know, I don't know the full story. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Why? Because it, it means that we didn't run around slandering each other. No, but what's the full story? Do not pursue drama. Now it's in 2020 to 2022. We can talk about this now. And you go, oh, he's going to give details. No, I'm not. Because our mission is not trying to figure out why we went through the earthquake. Our mission is to pursue Jesus, him crucified, and to see other people born again. I, I hear stories about other churches that come. Do you hear about that pastor? He's leaving town. I go, I know why. So why? Because you talk about him. No, you hear that pastor's kid fell pregnant. Is she married? I don't know. You see all through these letters that Jesus addresses the church. You know that he didn't write this so that to the churches and have it public knowledge. He got it given to John and John was able to deal with it. If your life group leader, I'm not talking about blatant sin, but your life group leader isn't perfect. Well done. He's allowed you and she's allowed you to look into their lives. There is no perfect life group. And if there is, we can't join it because we'll ruin it. There's no perfect church. Churches get up to nonsense. God help us that we don't. The Lord rebuke us if we do. But we called as Christians not to partner with the accuser, not to partner with the one who wants to cause division. If you're watching this online, we don't make a big fuss about you anymore because you should be in church by now. But if you're joining us because you couldn't make this morning's meeting, we love you dearly and it's fantastic that you have joined us online. But if you're watching us because you are tired, because there are, you're upset with all the churches that you've been to, I do suspect the problem lies with you. <laughs> I 
Well, go to seven churches, because one out of seven will be perfect, even according to Jesus' standards. I can run around and we can complain about every church. We can complain about pastors, life group leaders. We can, man, we just want to figure out this life as we go through together, pursuing Jesus, loving Jesus, and making a big fuss about him. Do we tolerate sin within leadership? Of course not. Do leaders sin? Of course, yes. Blatant pursuit of sin? Absolutely not. You get what I'm saying? This is what I'm trying to bring across. Revelation chapter 3. There's a whole lot of highlighted in yellow text. You're going to read it in your mind, in your heart with emphasis. And then I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come down and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Do not ever try to figure out why God loves you. You'll never figure it out. Do not ever try to figure out why you've got to love others. Love others. It's when we try to figure this out, why does God love me? Two things will happen. You either have pride in your heart, because you're going, because I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do this, and you are wrong. Why does God love you? And you can, I'm not going to try to figure it out for you, because he made you, and you made in his image. Man, we mess up. But I love the fact that Jesus says, I'm going to come and make sure that those that, uh, of the synagogue of Satan, they're going to come and acknowledge that I've loved you. No, they're not going to come and acknowledge that you're winning. They're not going to come and acknowledge that you've done well. They're not going to acknowledge that the church is growing. They're not going to acknowledge that your worship is fantastic. They're not going to acknowledge that the preaching is incredible. They're going to acknowledge that I've loved you. At the end of time, if the world can look at Lighthouse and go, God loved them. God loved them. Why? We don't know, but God loved them. Whether it was through a soup kitchen, whether it was people serving, it's not for us to figure out. But let it be said over our lives that when we get buried one day, it gets said, man, you can see God love that person. You can see God love that person because the grace and the mercy and the favor. If you ever want to be more like Jesus, love others. That, that's the most basic thing. I know we, you know we call to do greater things and that, that's what Jesus said. And we all want to be like him because we want to do the water into wine and then we want to walk on the water as well. And we want to do all the cool stuff. You want to do the basics right first before we do that. And that's love one another. For, for God so loved Secunda that he, he, he brought Riatia. For, for, God, for, God so loved, for God so loved Cecil that he, he put Leon there. For God so loved the company that you're in, he put you there. So that you can carry the love of Jesus into that company. Let's start living like that. For God so loved this town, I'm here. you here. We get to be here. So we're going to show the love of Jesus. I know some of you are thinking, get to the preach. This is it, guys. The when we love our city, we'll be motivated to pray for the sick. When we love each other, we'll be motivated to not gossip. When we love each other, we'll open our homes so that we can have life groups. We can, when we love each other, we open our hearts so we can look after those in need. When we because we love. But I'll carry on. I said I mustn't interrupt this. Since verse 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test inhabitants of the earth. We'll get to that part a bit later in Revelation. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Madness, that word. I mean, I'm sure you... Are you getting what Rex and Madness also said? That no one's going to come... We, we haven't been given the gift... We want, we've been giving in the gift thing, we've been given a gift that those that are around us need. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. I love that. When you look at the pillars were taken down. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from our God. I'll also write on them my new name. I'm not going to go into the new name. 
We get to the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth later on in the book of Revelation. We have as ears, let them hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. There's a significant part in this text, and we're going to get it this morning. Amen. We're going to grasp it, and we're going to live it out in our lives. Amen. All right. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Who of you watched the, the book was, I think, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? The C.S. Lewis book or Narnia? Maybe most of you have watched, the, you've watched Narnia. Can I just see by a raising of hands unless you cannot lift your arm? You've watched Narnia. So when I speak about it, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, and everyone goes, it's, it's demonic because there's talking animals. That's in the Bible as well. And there's all these weird creatures. That was written by a phenomenal theologian, C.S. Lewis, and he actually, it all represents Jesus. Um, the, the whole story represents salvation. It represents the Savior coming to earth, the one who died for us. It's, it's, it's funny that he called it Aslam because it's so close to Islam, but it's not at all. And he's got this whole representation of the lion that dies. I mean, it's phenomenal. Did you get the point of the story? Okay. If you didn't, I'm sure it's on one of the platforms that you're illegally streaming movies off. Go and find it and watch it. But I love the idea. And if you watch the movie, you have to remember that when they go, the kids get into the, the, the closet, the wardrobe. I know it's very popular these days for people to come out of the closet. This book is about the kids going in. And the kids, they go in, and as they go to the back of the cupboard, next minute they're in this frozen wonderland. For me, when God says, I will open doors that no one can shut, and there are doors that I've shut that no one will open, for me it's like getting into that cupboard, and all of a sudden, things that I never expected God to do, He's doing already. What He's expecting us to walk into, He's prepared already. I want to read this to you from 1 Samuel 16, because it speaks about the key of David. What is the key of David? Because it should be the key of Jesus. The problem is if, it called, if the text called it and if Jesus called it the key of Jesus, we'd go, well, Jesus is perfect. We can never use it. But he says, no, it's the key of David. It's something that happened in David's life. A door I opened in David's life that I'm going to give you. So what's happened? Saul is messed up. He's gone and he's, he's, he's played. Um, he's been disobedient. There's stuff that he did, but the whole thing was he was disobedient. And Samuel's been told, you have to go anoint the new king. And he's terrified. He said, if Saul finds out, he's going to kill me. And God says, go and do it anyway. And he goes, 1 Samuel 16. Samuel gets to Jesse's house. That's the father of David. Even Jesse says, have you come in peace? It was a very tense time in the nation. And verse 5 says, Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come to the sacrifice with me. Consecrate. Consecrate means to prepare yourself, clean yourself, to be made clean before God, set apart. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. They get this heifer, they sacrifice the heifer, so they've made the sacrifice, they've done the ceremony. So it's basically a life group with a bri. They've gotten ready. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Big, impressive Eliab. I'm hoping you know the story. God says, I don't look at the outside, I look at the inside. Okay. I am glad that it then says later, the one who was chosen, ruddy, which means he had a reddish tinge to him. Blue eyes. And then he's handsome. I mean, that's just what the word says. He gets rejected. He said, no, no, Eliab was rejected. No, no, it's the first time that David's been overlooked. He's not even there. Second son comes. And Samuel says, no, it's not this one. The third one, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. It runs through all of them. And eventually, in verse 11, so you ask Jesse, are these all the sons you have? We've kind of run out of options. And Jesse answers like this. They're still the youngest. He doesn't even call him by name. But he's tending the sheep. They get David, they anoint him, he becomes the great king of Israel. Was David pursuing this? No, he was pursuing God. Did he ever think for a second that he could be king? Not a chance. He was pursuing a relationship with God. You see, this is the problem that we have. We want God to be our spiritual locksmith. 
We want to do things and we want him to open the doors for it. So I want to do what I want to do and God, you must open the door. Lord, I want to go and I want to plant a church in Italy and Lord, I want to be in Tuscany. I want to be in a villa. Lord, I need you to take care of all of that because then God goes, I need you in Kailitsha. Lord, is Kailitsha Hebrew for Tuscany? No. Is it Greek? No. Is, no. It, I know this for me speaks volumes. Proverbs 8 verse 34. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. It's listening, watching, and waiting at my doorway. Do not get, don't use the scripture where I'm going to open doors and close doors. Do not use it for your doors. You need to wait on God to show you where his doors are. And then it says, so you wait, so you first listen, then you watch, and then you wait. I don't mind listening, I don't mind watching, but the waiting, I, I, don't, I, I fully trust God's goodness. I fully trust God's kindness. Oh my gosh, do I battle with his timing. Now if you don't, that's wonderful. You are holy. But this is what God's calling us to. He wants you to wait at his doors and he'll open those doors at the right time. His doors, his timing, then you step into it. You can't go and create your own opportunities. Lord, I've started this business. I've taken my whole pension. I've put everything into it. Lord, you need to open this door. Because you're so far down the corridor, he, we don't even have keys for that door. Lord, I've... Lord, I've gambled everything away, but at this slot machine, I need you to open a door that no man can shut, and I need you to shut that one that no man can open, because I messed with the lock. We cannot use the text to try and manipulate God to be our spiritual locksmith. God says to us, wait, watch, and listen. And so does this text. In verse 8, I know your deeds. Friends, I want to tell you, get busy with what God's doing. Stop wasting time with trying to do stuff that God's not involved with. That can be your business. It can be your hobby. If God's in it. Because he's watching your deeds. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. This is it. I know that you have little strength. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently. Little strength. It sounds like they're weak. No, little strength. And I'm busy working through this book. It's on the selection process of Navy SEALs. And they ask the guys, how do you know? You know, the Navy SEALs, uh, military, you know, leg of the U.S. Uh, defense, the, they specialize in almost everything. They are masters at, at everything military. When it comes to weapons, anything, they are phenomenal. They have the strictest and the harshest kind of a filtration program to see who they're going to get in and train before they spend the millions and who they're not. And this is what happens. They ask the guys, how do you know if the person's going to make it? How do you know who's going to make it through the selection process? They go, big bodybuilders fall out quickly. The jock that was the best athlete never makes it. The guy that makes it is normally the small little guy. But when everything is said and done, once he's absolutely exhausted, once he's finished, he still has a little strength left to help someone else. If we're going to pursue Jesus, we have to understand that we're in this for others. I'm not in this for myself. I'm in it to win it. But I'm, I'm a born-again Christian for the sake of those around me. Uh, I get to minister to people for their sake, not for mine. I'm born again. I'm I'm good. But if God just wanted us born again, we'd get born again and we'd get taken up into heaven. He needs us just to have enough strength, no matter how exhausted we are, no matter how difficult it is, that we can minister to others. Next thing is, kept my word. Do you know what the word of God is calling you into? You want financial breakthrough? Tithe. Tithe. Well, we don't believe in it. That's why you're battling. And you don't tithe... To your, your cousin's church who's kind of planted something, 
and it's kind of making it so you're going to tithe over there. No, you tithe to your store. You can't go and eat at the Hilton and go pay your bill at McDonald's. So I know it's difficult when I speak about finances because it's your, it's your demigod, and I say that with all due respect. You spend hours every week getting the money. Then when the, the pastor says, well, you, you now need to be obedient and give it to God, you go, well, all of it belongs to God. That's not true. <laughs> tithing, tithing is obedience. Now, Lord, I need you to bless me. God says, be obedient first. Lord, I need more. You're not faithful with the little I've given you. Lord, I will give 10%. I'm going to give 2% to the SPCA. I'm going to give 4% to that charity. I'm going to give 3% to the church. I can't remember the rest of the percentage because I'm broke. 10% of what you earn goes to the church, your storehouse. If you're sitting here, unless you're visiting from another church, you do not tithe here. If you, if you, this is your church, you tithe here. Tithe is easy. It's 10%. percent doesn't matter how you pronounce it. Tithing, tithing, teething, doesn't matter. Tinder is the best one. Lord, I need breakthrough in my health. Have communion, the Word of God says. By my stripes, you, you, you healed. Do this in remembrance of me, breaking bread. Best medicine ever. Have communion. Celebrate what God has done. If you keep my word, I'll give you the key of David. Never denied his name. Jesus Christ is not a swear word, and Christ is not his surname. Christ is his position, authority. Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. One's Greek, one's Hebrew. Jesus Christ, it's Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the one who died for us. I want you to be encouraged, not just to say Jesus Christ when, you, when you're praying in that, but have the Lord Jesus Christ that you're submitting to his name. Can you submit every single thing that you do to Jesus? If you, you've never denied his name. It's not about when people say to you, do you know who Jesus is? And you say, yes, I do. I serve him. It's about everything in your life that you do not d- deny who Jesus is. Jesus is the authority in my family. Jesus is the authority in my, in my life. He's my authority where I work. He's my authority where I serve. And it says, and you endure patiently. Have you endured patiently or are you getting impatient and making your own plans? You want to see God open doors. Keep to his word. Stick to his word. What his word says, do that. Know that you just need a small amount of strength to make it. As you're enduring patiently, allow his name to be the authority in your life. He speaks to this church in Philadelphia. He says, I'm going to open stuff that no man can shut. What he's expecting of them, what he's actually saying is, guys, I'm opening stuff you got to walk through. I, I'm not going to carry you through. You need to walk into what I'm calling you into. That word that Madness had about God has given you this gift of gold, but you're not celebrating it because it's not a necklace and it's not a watch and it's not what you... God has given you a gifting and he wants you to work it out. He wants you to take the gift. You might have the gift of intercession. You enjoy praying for people. You've got to work it out by praying for people. Don't say, Lord God, give me time. You've got 24 hours. Make it work. You've got a gift. When you pray for the sick, they get healed. You don't need a ministry. You don't need a title. You don't need to be ordained. God has given you the gift. You have to start praying for people. God has given you the gift of encouragement. Start encouraging people. God has given you the gift to speak to people. If God has given you the gift of caring, you know that gift. You light the fire, they come. I'm telling you, that's the start of leadership. That's the start of leadership. Allow us to develop you into a good leader. But you have to take what God's given you and process it, work it out for the sake of the kingdom. That Proverbs 8 gets me. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. Regardless of the tremors and regardless of the aftershocks, regardless of what's happened already in your life, whatever the trauma's been, that we can say, I wait patiently on whatever God has called me to do, I'll do it. I'll go where he calls me to go. I'll do what he asks me to do. It could be so insignificant. It could be praying for the guy that just put fuel in your car. It could be praying for someone that's helped you at the checkout counter when you're buying groceries. It could be a staff member. It could be your boss. It's the small steps of obedience that allow us to walk in victory. I'll end with this. You're not here for your sake. You're here for the sake of others. And it requires us to lay down our lives and say, Jesus, you set the pace. You set the standard. In my family, my workplace, in my ministry. Let's pray.
while eyes are closed, I want you to close your eyes. I want to tell you a bit of a story quickly. 1200 AD. Eyes closed, please. 1200 AD. This church in Philadelphia had lasted the longest. All the other churches had already been closed down. And Philadelphia was still around. In the 1200s, the church was attacked by Islamic extremists who ran in and killed everyone. Every child, woman and man, leaders, no one made it out alive. They slaughtered all of them. It was quite brutal. It ended the church. Everyone died. The reason why I'm telling you this story is because when I was reading this, my first thought was, I wonder if they'd made an altar call for people to get saved before the church was attacked. Had there been an opportunity given for everyone to give their lives to Jesus? Had an opportunity been given for everyone to give their lives to Christ? I, I hope so. Unless they just denied Jesus and they thought they made it out alive. I'm asking you this morning, if you had to go now, and I don't want to be morbid and sad, but if you had to go now, if you had to die now, would you be united with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or does your eternity look very different? I'm challenging you this morning. Have you made that commitment and surrendered to Jesus, accept, accepting Him as your Savior? It's not about a feel good it's not about well, what I can get out of this. What he calls you to is to lay everything down. What he calls you to is to surrender everything. You have to repent for all the sins that you've committed. And he's just, and I say just and faithful because he, he paid the price for your sin. I'm asking you this morning, and you might be the only person sitting here. If you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, could you raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you. Just wave your hand at me there. Just confirm. Yeah. Well done. Well done. I want to do this for the sake of time. I'm going to wait for you, for those that raise their hand. I'm going to wait for you at the front of the church at the end of the meeting. And I'm putting the responsibility on you to come and meet with me and I'm going to pray with you and I'm going to lead you in making a commitment to Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, you need to come and meet up with me after the meeting. You need to come. You need to submit this morning. And you might think, well, I've been coming to church for years. It doesn't matter. You have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He is who He says He is, what the Word says He is. And give your life to Him and be fully committed to Him. This is not a half in, a half out. Lord, I pray that You stir our hearts, that what You're calling us to, Lord, where You're calling us to endure. Lord, I pray for every family that needs to endure, where they're facing something that is so difficult, and it feels like they're tremors of it's coming back again. The sickness is coming back again. The catastrophe is coming back again. There's a reminder of failure. Lord, I pray. Bring peace. Lord, I pray for every person that is needing a fresh revelation of what the Word of God should mean to them. Lord, I pray for that. Lord, I pray for every person who needs an increase in discernment to know at which door to wait at, which doorway to watch, so that they know what door is going to be open for them. Lord, I thank you that David got the job without even having to do a tender for it. Lord, I thank you that David was invited without even asking for it. Lord, I pray that over your children this morning, that that key of David will be released. That what needs to be released over their lives because of what you've called them into, that will be released. As we endure patiently waiting for you, we surrender to you, our King. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.